Hello everybody. Welcome to today's webcast. This is a uh, standards update webcast and it's actually a dual purpose webcast at this point. Uh, we, we're going to have um, a couple of speakers, and I'll introduce them soon and you know, you know them of course, um, that, who will give us an update from the uh, March 2017 uh, standards block meetings that were uh, held out west in uh, the U.S. And then after that, uh, we're going to have a good friend of ours come and give us a wrap-up uh, summary of what uh, his uh, views are about uh, NAB and what he saw and some uh, cool uh, things that were on the floor and were being demonstrated. But uh, without uh, uh, giving away too much of it, I'd uh, like to uh, get started. And uh, I am your host, Joel Welch, SIMPTE's Director of Education. I'm going to do a little housekeeping here. As I said, uh, this is a uh, standards update webcast, and these are uh, quarterly webcasts. We've extended them to uh, 90 minutes. Folks said that they would like more time uh, for questions, and we did uh, tend to uh, run over quite a bit uh, uh, because of questions and, and presentations, and we do cover SIMPTE uh, standards and uh, select standards-related topics. Um, they are free to everybody, including the on-demand videos. Uh, these are posted uh, to YouTube, and uh, everybody can see uh, what kinds of uh, activities are going on in the uh, standards development uh, pillar of SIMPTE. And uh, Pete, you uh, you get uh, to go on YouTube this time as well. I hope you don't mind. As I said, we have uh, two parts to our webcast today, and. Um, the standards part will be uh, handled by Alan Lambshed. Uh, Alan is uh, the SIMPTE Standards Vice President. He's a SIMPTE Fellow, uh, and he's also on SIMPTE Board of Governors. And then my uh, Home Office colleague, uh, Howard Luck, is Director of Engineering and uh, Standards. He uh, uh, is on uh, SIMPTE staff, just as I am. And uh, they are going to go first. Actually, Alan is going to uh, present the uh, information um, in the slides. And then uh, Howard says he's going to provide the color commentary. Looking forward to that. And once we uh, once we um, get through the uh, standards portion, then I'm, we're going to hand the floor over to Mr. Pete Putman, as I said. I think you know him already. And he's going to give us uh, his thoughts on NAB and, and share some of the uh, interesting things that uh, he saw there. So with that, uh, Alan, uh, the floor is yours. I'm going to be quiet, and uh, I'm going to go away for a little bit. OK, thank you, Joel. Um, so let's get started right in here. Uh, we'll try and move through this quickly to allow maximum time for uh, Pete at the end. OK, so uh, today we're going to be talking about some of the outcomes from our March standards meetings. Uh, we had uh, nine technology committees and 15 subgroups that met first week in March in San Jose, California. Uh, it was hosted by Intel uh, at their Altera facility. Uh, we had over 60 people attended in person, and there was a significant group, probably almost as many, who participated by remote access. Uh, there are currently over 200 active projects, so we're not going to talk about them all today. Obviously, we have to hit the highlights only, but if you want to find out about all those projects, there is an outcome report that's posted on the SIMPTE website, and uh, <clears throat> that link will be uh, shown at the uh, end of the standard part of this uh, presentation again. So let's start off with um, probably one of the hottest topics of our uh, session, which was uh, the professional media over IP networks. Um, <clears throat> ST2110 is the suite of standards that specifies the carriage and synchronization and description of separate elementary streams over IP for the purpose of live production. So really the whole uh, impetus behind 2110 is to provide a mechanism that um, is going to be ultimately replacing our uh, true friend uh, and sometimes enemy standard uh, SDI uh, in all its flavors, but over that'll happen over a period of uh, many years, obviously. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to get a system that will be as robust as SDI has been for the last uh, couple of decades, 
and something that will work as well, but at the same time provide new opportunities for working in the IP environment. So let me just briefly describe the 2110 suite of standards. There are six parts uh, currently that are being worked on. Uh, the first one is uh, dash 10, which is the system timing and definition. So it's sort of the overview and it describes how RTP packets are being used to transport all this media around. Uh, the second one is part 20, which is the uncompressed active video. Uh, one of the main differences between 2110 and SDI is that 2110 carries only the active video pixels. Uh, so all of the sync and the blanking areas that were carried in SDI are no longer being carried in the uh, video stream. They, that information occurs in different places. Uh, Dash 30 is the um, PCM digital audio. So it leverages the AES67 standard and uh, builds upon it uh, as part of the 2110 suite. Uh, then part 21 is uh, those first three are the are the sort of the building block fundamentals of the system I should add. <clears throat> so part 21 uh, is a timing model. So the reason for the timing models was to allow flexibility for managing traffic flows in the networks. And uh, we already know that some implementations will be hardware FPGA based, some will be software based and the timing constraints that are available in software based systems are uh, not as tight as they are in the FPGA based systems, at least not today. So the timing model allows for that information to be propagated through the system so that receivers can properly set up their buffers uh, to make sure that the, uh, the right buffer sizes are available for the sender of the data. Uh, part 31 is uh, for carrying of audio that's wrapped in the AES3 um, uh, format. Uh, AES3, as we all know, has been the workhorse of the industry for uh, 20 or more years, actually, since it was invented. Um, and uh, it was carried on SDI. So uh, what part 31 is, is, is a way to carry AES3 data uh, in a transparent way without any modification. And that does a couple of things. One, it allows for AES3 audio. It also permits the transport of a whole bunch of data uh, formats that have been formatted into AES3 uh, carried according to the SMPTE 337 standards. So there's um, things like compressed audio like Dolby E and, and other ones. That's just an example. I think there's probably about 20 or more different uh, formats now that are wrapped into AES3 um, using 337. So those will all be able to be carried transparently over part 31. Uh, ancillary data is a very important part. So part 40 talks about how we carry ancillary data, things like closed captioning, time code, uh, AFD, and other uh, stuff that typically was in the bank area of SDI. And then part 50 uh, is uh, the part that talks about interoperability with ST 2022-6 streams. So 2022-6 is currently being used extensively for uh, long haul transmissions over IP networks. It's not very well suited to use within a plant because all of the uh, audio and ancillary data and everything is all bundled together. Uh, but uh, there is a need to be able to transport that stuff uh, throughout the um, production plant as well. And so Dash 50 will describe a way of how to do that. So where are we with all these uh, parts? So the first three, 10, 20, and 30, have completed their FCD ballot. That was actually done uh, back uh, before our March, just before our March meetings. All the comments, and there were quite a few, have been now resolved. And um, it, uh, we anticipate that it will um, start its draft publication vote very shortly. Uh, part 21 is currently ready for its FCD ballot. Uh, FCD is really the, the the main technical ballot uh, which seeks to ferret out all the issues, uh, technical issues in the standard. And then the remaining parts are still in their development stage, in their working draft stage. So I think this is where I take over just a little bit from Alan. Um, I thought it was really funny when I walked the floor at NAB because I walked past the Synergy booth and they had a little placard with a skull and crossbones and said SDI must die. 
Um, I thought that was pretty hilarious, basically. Um, although SDI will probably be around with us for quite some time moving in the future, um, just like we used to have islands of, of equipment, I think that's what you're going to see with the new IP stuff coming out, unless you have a complete greenfield, and then maybe you'll do IP throughout the plant from a start and we'll never look back. Um, one of the things that SEMTI has been involved with for some time now is the JTNM, which is the Joint Task Force on Network Media. Uh, and as such, it's kind of been the clearinghouse for helping with things like roadmaps to see where we're at with the video over IP, uh, a framework for software development, and also um, you know some reports that have gone out. But one of the things I think that's been fantastic lately is and this started at IBC, was a way to actually get uh, companies that have equipment that's based on standards and specifications to hold interop demonstrations, basically, to, to demonstrate that the equipment is really actually working in the field and not just working on paper like a lot of standards have done uh, before they got actually tried out in the field. So it's a real uh, great effort. Uh, these are uh, some of the main companies that are involved in the IP showcase that happened at NAB. Uh, AES Ames, AMWA, EBU, IABM, Network Media Alliance, the NAB Pilot, of course, SEMPTI and BSF. Um, maybe, Alan, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, and what was done was basically to set up a uh, stand at NAB. Uh, here's one picture from it that actually included about 60 um, different IP software products from about 40 or more companies actually all interoperating together on the floor. So this is quite a feat, as you can see from all the racks of equipment and stuff that's going together, and quite an effort by a lot of people that kind of pushed together to get this IP kind of mini facility up and working. It, it was a huge hit at NAB. Um, it was so so good that NAB even complained to the IP showcase that they were blocking the aisles. So that's a, that's a great thing that happened. So it got a lot of traction and really helps uh, push this standard forward, not only just with 2110, but it also works on ST. 2059 that's been approved for some time, which is the timing standard of PTP uh, over IP. And then also, of course, AES 67 uh, and some of the other ones, uh, registry and discovery from AMWA, ISO 4, and things like that. So this was a, a really good, successful uh, thing that happened at, at uh, NAB. And I think uh, it will be repeated again at IBC for those folks that are on the, the European side of the continent and, and attending IBC. So I think. Uh, that's all the news to print on the IP showcase. So I'll turn it back over to Alan to, to pick up on the next one. Okay, uh, so I think we went to slides. Yeah, perfect. Okay, uh, so let's move on to the next uh, project. So uh, we've called this uh, part of the presentation better pixels. So this encompasses things like high dynamic range, wide color gamut, and all of those kinds of things, different color spaces. And there's a bunch of projects that are going on, uh, mostly in our 10E committee, uh, which is our essence committee, and in our 32 and F um, <clears throat> committee. So the uh, one project that's been going on for a long time is the content dependent metadata for color volume transportation, transformation, uh, also known as ST294. It's a six part suite of standards uh, there are sort of uh, two parts that are the core components. There are four application schemes on how that metadata is used. Uh, one uh, is a, uh, there's also a KLV encoding and an MXF wrapping for that information. So that project is done now and that group uh, will be disbanded shortly um, because there's, uh, the same people are involved in so many other things so they need to get on to other projects. Um, just a, sorry, I want to interrupt. Just a side note: uh, the ATSC is also um, referencing to 2094 as well, too. So it's moved actually into the broadcast world as well. So it's great to see that happen. Right, and there's a lot. I, I should just say one of one of my jobs is to approve all the outgoing liaisons to organizations, and there's been a lot of other SDOs that have uh, asked for liaison copies of the standard because they want to include. Um, information uh, going forward. Uh, the CEA is, or the CTA is it's now called, is another one of those. Um, uh, the Academy Color Encoding Specification, known as ACES, uh, that is, uh, was recently modified to add some new color space stuff, and uh, there's a new 35PM project to specify an IMF application 
using the new ACES uh, essence. And then uh, there is also in 31FS uh, a project that's making a constrained version of DPX, which is a very old standard, but it's a workhorse in the industry. And so this is a constrained version to carry the HDR and white color gamut. And it's uh, well through the drafting stage, and we expect to see it in ballot shortly. Yeah, one one note on that as well too is uh, it used to be just called ST two sixty eight, which was the DPX file format. Uh, since there's a new uh, constrained version of that, we've actually changed uh, two sixty eight to be dash one, and this new constrained version will be two sixty eight dash two. So just a little heads up that uh, that old standard is exactly the same. It's just getting a part number to it, which is a dash one part number. Okay, thanks, Howard. Okay, so then in 32 and F, there's uh, several projects. Uh, the, the biggest one is to how to signal all this uh, HDR and white color gamut stuff on all of our interfaces. And there's been a lot of work going on uh, in, uh, in that area. And the reason for the need, the need for that is that we want downstream devices to be able to correctly process the information. And uh, so, uh, payload ID has been the workhorse of the interface, the SDI interfaces for a long time now. And so there's been some modifications proposed and in some cases finalized to carry signaling information for uh, HDR and white color gamut. So what that's going to do is it's going to spawn a whole bunch of revisions to all of the SDI standards that have the possibility of carrying uh, HDR and there'll be new signaling it's included in that. And uh, the ITU have some standards also that are uh, parallel to SMPT standards, so we've made some really hard efforts to make sure that the ITU standards are harmonized with what we do in SMPT. Uh, we really don't want two diverging different payload IDs for the same information. And then, Alan, just to, uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, just a comment on that, just so we don't panic everybody. I'm assuming that the payload ID is going to be backwards compatible for those systems that do not work on HDR. Yes, it's absolutely backwards compatible. The um, For those that aren't familiar with, with payload ID, it's a four byte ancillary data packet and uh, there were, was a bunch of unused uh, bits in the packet which were all set to zero previously. So the zero condition of those in the new payload IDs means it's non-HDR. And then if, if the uh, bits are something are either ones or in combinations, they're other binary combinations, then those are the various combinations that will be HDR. So old systems can ignore um, any of the bits that are zero because they always mean the same thing as they did before. And that's that was one of the challenges was to make sure that we did it in a backwards compatible way. Uh, the other project that this group is working on is to um, a way to package the extended uh, HDR and WCG metadata and so they're working on methods to do that and that standard is, is really just starting to take shape at this point. Um, so moving on to the next topic, um, we've got two technology committees that deal uh, with uh, cinema related issues. One is 25 CSS which is our uh, cinema sound group so they talk only about sound issues. And then 21DC is our digital cinema group and they talk about all the rest of the digital cinema uh, issues. So 25CSS has been working for quite a while now on an immersive sound model and bitstream project uh, which is called ST2098 and as you can see from the slide there, there's six parts that are being proposed, uh, or five parts rather that are being proposed, the metadata data defini definitions, the bitstream specification itself, which will be modeled after uh, the Dolby Atmos um, stream. It won't be exactly Dolby Atmos, but it will be modeled on the Dolby Atmos stream. Um, and then there's an engineering guideline for what the renderer should do. Um, there's another RP on uh, how we test renderers to make sure that they are doing what they're supposed to do. And then there's another one that talks about audio channels and sound field groups. Um, so that's, that's probably the majority of the work that 25CSS has been working on. The other part of their work has to do with the B-chain uh, uh, system in theaters and 
uh, they first started with a report and one of the things that that report identified was that there was no real good uh, standardized way of calibrating theaters using modern tools. So they're working on two different RPs uh, uh, that'll be known as RP2096-1 and-2 for uh, B chain theater calibration. And those RPs have completed their FCD ballot and they're resolving comments at the moment. And uh, then the 21 DC work that's related to immersive sound is uh, that they will be starting shortly a project to update the DCP to accommodate immersive sound. And that's, you know, you can say it in one sentence, but it's a big job to do that. So it involves a bunch of different areas and um, uh, without getting into the, the details of it, uh, that will be a significant part of their work. Uh, they're also working on a bunch of other updates to existing documents. MXF is another uh, major effort that uh, our standards people are doing. Um, MXF is the material exchange format and it has uh, been standardized now for quite a few years, probably 10 years or so. Um, the, the last revision of the main document was in 2011 and there's been two uh, amendments since then and so uh, they're undertaking the 31FS Technology Committee which is responsible for MXF is undertaking a project to harmonize uh, to rather roll in uh, those two amendments into the main document so that there'll be one document that has all of the uh, primary specification in one place there have also been identified uh, some issues that need to be addressed in the MXF uh, specification. So as a second project, uh, they will be undertaking to um, make some revisions, some further revisions to the document, which will seek to address uh, the, the other issues. But they felt it was important to get a stable document of everything rolled up as the primary uh, foundation for doing those uh, later amendments. So that is a big project uh, that is being led by um, Bruce Devlin, who uh, happens to have the email, uh, Mr. MXF, um, and he's sort of the MXF guru. So he's leading that work along with a bunch of other uh, experts in it. I won't go yeah, through. Uh, sorry to interrupt again, Alan, but this is a, a, a huge deal because now, as probably some of you may realize, MXF is used in a lot of different areas, especially like IMF, for example. So it's a large toolkit that other documents have kind of uh, pulled the pieces they like out, constrained it, and use MXF. So touching the major document, this 377, is quite a bit of work and uh, quite detailed. So it's good to see it happen, uh, but they have to take a, a really delicate carving knife when they go through and, and tidy this stuff it's, up. It's, it's like intricate surgery. Um, and I won't, I won't go into all the other documents that are listed on the slide there. Those are the uh, other projects. There's actually, and I think that's not even all of them, there's a total of 13 MXF related projects going on in 31FS uh, currently. And one, one item I'll kick in here is the MXF time code mapping and labeling. There's uh, two reports that are coming out, uh, should be at the first of the month after the Memorial Day holidays. One is the time code summit report, uh, getting user requirements uh, gathered together to uh, list those out. And then also there is some report on MXF time code uh, addressing some of the issues and some suggestions on what to do as we move forward. So look forward to those hitting this empty website uh, coming soon right after the Memorial Day holiday for us here in the U.S. Great. Thanks, Howard. Okay, 34CS um, has really two projects that they're working on. One is uh, BXF, which is again a very large suite. I think there's a nine or ten parts to that suite and they've had now uh, this is the fifth major revision of the BXF suite. So this talks about um, interfacing various pieces of, of equipment in the broadcast uh, chain. Um, and so there's been a bunch of new features added, which they're calling collectively BXF 5.0. Uh, there is a new um, SDK that is being drafted uh, for the in the current round that will allow uh, companies to actually hook into the BXF in a standardized way. So uh, you should see those probably sometime in the mid-summer 
I'm guessing. And then the other one is the media device control over IP. Um, SMPTE ST uh, 2071, there's uh, four parts to that document. The first two have been published uh, and revised recently. Parts three and four are currently undergoing revisions to uh, put into effect some of the changes that were made in the first parts. And those ones are just completing their uh, approval uh, as draft publication votes. So the votes are actually happening as we speak. Uh, next project is IMF. Um, IMF is the interoperability, uh, interoperable mastering format, and uh, it is a, a large collection of documents uh, that have been published over the last year and a half or so. Um, many of them have now uh, been published for more than a year, and our standard practice is to review all new SMPTE standards and RPs and EGs. Uh, at the one year point to see are there any changes required to them, do they need any updating and so um, the interoperability testing that has been ongoing in the 35 PM group uh, has identified a bunch of issues in the IMF uh, standards that needed to be updated and so most of these changes are as a result of things that were discovered in the interoperability testing. Uh, there's a few new things that are being added, but some of them were fixes. And so you'll see a bunch more of them. There's five that I've listed here, which are currently uh, just been completed. And then there's some more that are happening. Uh, the one at the bottom there is uh, I maybe should have listed in that um, a list of the Better Pixels projects because uh, basically it's updating the IMF uh, common image pixel color schemes to support wide color gamut and high dynamic range, uh, and also the transfer function that's identified in ST2084. Yeah, also what's going on, they're really not kind of highlighted here on the thing, but there is quite a bit of work now and a lot of interest in IMF. So there's been <clears throat> a user group forum that's been uh, put together that should kick off relatively soon here in the month of June, and that's happening with our sister partner, HPA, uh, that's kind of putting that together. So if you're interested in IMF, you're working in IMF, and you want to join a forum, generally this is a, a group of manufacturers, users, uh, and users and content creators uh, to all get around and talk about issues that come up as you're applying IMF in the real world. So uh, if you are a practitioner of IMF, I would encourage you to seek out some information uh, via probably through the HPA website, our sister company. Okay, thanks, Howard. And as I mentioned, the other uh, one of the other big chunks of work that 35 PM is doing is uh, plug fests, and these have been very, very useful. So there's been uh, there's three or four uh, that I'm, I've listed here, but there's been an ongoing stream of these. And so what basically it allows different vendors and different um, users to get together to uh, make IMF files to transfer them to people that are on the receiving end, have them decode them, and make sure that they can properly decode them and parse them correctly. And um, by and large, um, the results have been very positive uh, for um, most of these uh, plug fests that have happened, and they're, they're still ongoing because there's new features being rolled out in IMF all the time. And so the, the plan is finish the standard, do the plug fest, go back, revise the standard to make effect of any of the changes that are required. Howard, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, sure. And, and one of the things that has been kind of pushed towards the end of standardization for the IMF, just because there was a really a new topic, was the output profile list, the OPL. So now we're seeing a lot more action focused on the OPL, which is really a powerful tool to kind of create these different profiles for transcoding out to the delivery side of the equation. So you're going to see a lot more focus on the OPL and uh, that's a great thing. So if again, if you're you're involved with this, interested in it, um, please um, seek out uh, the PlugFest through the SEMPTE website and SEMPTE standards community. Right. Okay, so the 35 PM actually has a whole group that's just in uh, it's called the Sample Material Interchange Group, and that, that's their mandate is to organize all of these plug fests and uh, analyze the results, feed that stuff back to the main document drafting groups. 
Um, so just to refresh again, uh, the meeting outcome reports of each of our quarterly meetings are always in the uh, uh, SIMTI website uh, in the meeting reports page and there's general information about you participating in SIMTI standards activities on the engineering committees page of the SIMTI website. And I think that brings us to the end of the standards uh, part of this uh, webcast, Joel. And it does. Um, the next session will be um, Pete Putman. But before I give the floor to Pete, um, I am uh, I'm putting the uh, links that were in those slides in the chat box. The first one is uh, the link so that you can get more information about uh, involvement with the standards committees. And the second one is a direct link to the reports that uh, Howard and uh, Alan were talking about. And I'm going to do a shameless plug here as well. Um, SIMTI Education uh, is uh, committed to helping people learn more about SIMTI standards. And um, w you mentioned IMF. And we, we actually recently launched uh, a virtual course on uh, the essentials of IMF uh, taught by uh, Pierre uh, Anthony Lemieux and uh, Bruce Devlin. Um, you can find information about that on the SIMTI website. And we're considering other uh, standards as well. And 2110 is actually, I think, one that is uh, uh, next in the queue. And we're considering MXF and uh, the new timing standards, etc. cetera. So um, when, uh, what I'd like to ask folks to do um, at the end of the webcast is uh, using the question and chat box uh, of uh, all the standards that were covered today or, or are top of mind. Um, tell us which ones you think need to have webcasts and, and which ones need you know full-on virtual courses and uh, I think we'll uh, uh, that'll be very helpful in, in uh, determining which ones come next. So uh, with that um, I'd like to invite our uh, guests to uh, uh, post questions uh, in the uh, question box, in the chat box. There are none at the moment, gentlemen. Uh, but um, uh, let's see. Anybody have a question? If you want to ask a verbal question, please say, I have a verbal question for Alan or Howard or both. And if you want to type a text question, that's OK, too. Um, but uh, verbal questions are preferred. And I'm not seeing any any questions, gentlemen. I think you uh, covered everything and, and gave, gave us a, a full update so people know what's going on. So I guess uh, the time has come for us to give the floor to uh, Mr. Pete Putman. And Pete's going to uh, give us an idea of what he saw at NAB. And uh, uh, Pete, the floor is yours. All right, thanks very much, Joel. Um, Yes, NEB was a very interesting show this year. It always is. It's good to see the attendance is picking up. Um, I don't cover all the topic areas, uh, but there are certain areas that I have particular interest in, and not surprisingly, most of those relate to display technology. So what we see, how we get the signals into those devices, how we move them around. Then there were a few things here and there to be found that were, were interesting. So first off, um, I would best describe this year's show as in transition. As you just heard, there's this big move to everything being IT, IP-centric, and a lot of work going on with standards for that, moving files around, streaming, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you saw a lot of that at the show this year. I don't can't say that there was any one particular item that jumped out at me that was revolutionary, is more evolutionary. Um, in terms of my perspective, the hot topics, obviously, this year, TSC 3.0. Uh, H.265 uh, encoding and decoding, high dynamic range, wide color gamut, high frame rate, the ubiquitous cloud, um, LEDs, which might have been the biggest thing at the show because they're everywhere, and then uh, cloud storage and playback of uh, media assets. I'd give you an idea how crazy LED was. Uh, there was over a dozen manufacturers that I saw at the show, and I never heard of most of them before. They're uh, largely based in China. And they're trying to uh, break into the U.S. market. Um, lots of H.265 encoders and decoders, and the prices are slowly starting to come down on these, which is good timing what with the expanded use of uh, 4K and enhancements like HDR and white color gamut. Um, lots of demos of HDR content distribution and playback. 
Uh, again, very, very hot topic of the show. And then there was that gorgeous Ferrari California and the ATSC exhibit. Um, and I say Mark uh, Richer and Dave Arlen's dream car, they were sitting in it at one point. I, I heard a story they wanted to fly a TV over this, but I guess the rental company said if anything happens to that car, you own it. So uh, that's why you didn't see the TV flying on it. But what a beauty. Anyway, um, ATSC exhibit was big, and it did a very good job of showing all the different component parts that make up ATSC, uh, which was good because in the past it was kind of hard to understand that. But I think for anybody that didn't really know what it, what it meant, what this new uh, digital TV distribution system means, uh, is it was very, very well explained. Um, unfortunately, due to some technical issues, we weren't able to see any HDR content, but we did see uh, 4K content uh, delivered uh, across the platform. We saw delivery to uh, uh, the IP, to mobile devices. Um, and that begs the question, um, given that it's uh, not been quite eight years since we had the conversion to ATSC-1, how will consumers embrace this format? How will they retrofit to it? If they like it and they're interested in it, does it mean they buy a new television that has uh, 3.0 Demux and everything built in? Uh, will they buy a sidecar box? Will it be a USB stick? Uh, one particular uh, mode of distribution that I've seen touted, which I think is actually very attractive, and, and there's a parallel to it in the cable industry we'll see in a minute, is actually having a set-top box in your house that de demods and then uh, transmits streams uh, over 802.11 AC channel bonding uh, at 5 gigahertz uh, through Wi-Fi. So if you have a smart TV, if you have a mobile phone, you have a tablet, pretty much anything that's got 5 gig uh, compatibility in it, that you can watch whatever the video content is, and you don't really need to upgrade everything because most of these devices nowadays do support uh, 5 gig Wi-Fi, and they do support channel bonding. And a parallel topic that uh, was really discussed at the show to a greater extent than I would have expected was the concept of doing HDR with 1080p broadcasts, or 2K if you want to call it that. Uh, that might actually be a better fit to the uh, limitations that stations have and what they perceive to be the demand for HDR, to uh, do it at 1080p and not necessarily 4K. Um, on the cable side, in the Aris booth, uh, they showed a whole bunch of new designs for set-top boxes that are doing over-the-top based delivery. So instead of traditional coax cable QAM modulated signal that comes in and is DMOD and connects to your TV as HDMI, that signal comes in uh, delivered in an over-the-top format, basically on, encoded with IP headers, and then it goes through your modem, and then it is rebroadcast to the house over a uh, wireless link. And yes, that is a sidecar box. I actually mistook that for a skid that you'd put a glass on or something like a coaster, but they said, no, that's actually a set-top box. Like, I don't know how long they would survive in my house. I'm sure people would try to use them as uh, coasters for their drinks, but it decodes H.265, supports um, the CT861-3 standards for HDR white color gamut, and just uses channel bonding to stream to smart televisions, the thinking being that if the TVs already have a lot of the internet access uh, functionality built into them, and the ability to uh, pick up a TCP IP stream, a real-time protocol stream, and show it, then why reinvent the wheel? Why not just use that structure that's already in the average person's house? Virtual reality. Um, I have mixed feelings about VR. Last year, there was a ton of it at the show. This year, it didn't seem to be such a big deal. Most of the exhibits, as they were last year, were up in the North Hall, but they seemed to be shoehorned over into one of the corners. And this prompted some of us to wonder if virtual reality, at least as it's being presented to us, is still a solution in search of a problem. Um, we're having debates about the near-to-eye resolution. Most of the headsets I've looked to do not have high enough resolution that I don't see the screen door effect or see some display artifacts. And in fact, it might need to be as much as 8K per eye. We're a long ways from seeing that. And there are even some groups out there that are doing VR gaming that are saying they'd like to see 11K per eye. Well, I think it's going to be a little while before we see that come to market. Um, we saw a lot of 360-degree cameras this year. Um, they were everywhere. You, you couldn't throw a rock without hitting them. And again, most of these manufacturers are coming into the marketplace from China, and they're also showing up at the Consumer Electronics Show. And there were some cool demonstrations of spatial sound. Uh, so you had to wear a lot of stuff on your head to um, ha have the effect work at all. But... Uh, there were a few companies that were doing things in little egg-cased seats uh, that were impressive. But 
here's the problem. At present, I consider the headgear, most of which is based on Oculus Rift designs and the headphones, to just be too much stuff that you're wearing on your head. Um, and, and we're starting to see now some issues with people who cannot perceive uh, virtual reality correctly. They cannot sync up the motion and visual cues uh, and the, with those cues in their body or cues that are missing, and they get sick. So um, I have seen uh, demos of immersive displays where you actually stand in the middle of it, flexible OLEDs, uh, and no headphones required, no headgear required, but it does fill your field of view and does do spatial sound, and I really think that this might be where we're headed as opposed to having to strap all this stuff on your head. And there are also several examples of streaming VR content, so channels you could log into and watch uh, different VR content. But just informally polling people is, uh, even those that have bought uh, the headsets from different companies, is how often do you use it? Well, they really don't. They don't use it all that much because it was sort of a gimmick, and after the first few times they used it, they kind of put them away and said, well, you know, it's kind of a pain in the neck to set it all up and watch it, and uh, the headsets are heavy, and then i got to wear the headphones and everything else. So I'm not trying to be a... Debbie Downer about this, but at the moment I think this is still very much in baby step stage and we may need to go in another direction to make this work. So um, there's Insta360, they were claiming that an 8K camera head, that's obviously additive resolution, uh, not 8K per lens. Uh, G-Audio had this little booth uh, where you could do immersive sound, it was very comfortable to sit in that little egg. And then off to your right, another one of many, many companies selling 360 cameras, 360 Rise. Um, You'll notice that the prices on these are becoming commoditized very, very quickly. These are considered by most people to be consumer items and not professional electronics. This was impressive, though. Uh, the uh, wizards at Fraunhofer always come up with something cool every year, and this is a 360-degree camera that's got 4 by 18 cores with effectively 10,000 uh, picture elements, so 10K resolution uh, in 360 degrees, and they were transmitting 25 frame per second video at 22 megabits a second. Um, and you can zoom and pan to any one area of interest that you want. So um, again, a prototype, who knows where we go with this, but um, all impressive nonetheless. And this is exactly what happens to you when you spend too much time in the virtual reality booths. So um, I'm not quite the man I used to be after I left NEB. Switching to uh, Ultra HD and HDR. Um, at CES, we talk about television nowadays. Everybody assumes we're talking about Ultra HD. It's been there long enough, four years, that uh, TV is just Ultra HD. So what about an NEB? Well, a lot of the same exhibits I saw in 2016, uh, they, they changed a little bit. Maybe the exhibitor moved to a different spot, but they weren't showing an awful lot of stuff that was radically different. Um, HDR, Dolby Vision, Technicolor, Hybrid, Log Gamma were all uh, demoed at the show. Samsung did not show. Uh, their tone mapping. I was surprised not to see it. It wasn't there. Um, you know, companies are now starting to make portable recorder players that support HDR. So AJA had a, a very interesting little box that would do that. And I mentioned earlier that uh, we're starting to see talk about promoting HDR for 1080p and 2K, and Hitachi and Sony were both uh, doing presentations on exactly that idea. Um, also, in the uh, toy store, NHK and NTT showed some really cool encoders for UHD with HDR and high frame rate, starting to see more emphasis on high frame rate. Uh, and, of course, all the LED manufacturers, if they're not promoting it, they're not being very smart about it because LEDs can innately do high dynamic range and wide color gamut. And one of the cooler things I saw at the show that was not too well uh, promoted uh, in the TV Logic booth, a prototype dual LCD HDR monitor, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. So at NTT, um, they were all about high frame rate. They were showing 120 hertz content, 4K, and they have built these prototype encoders that will do four separate 4K 60 streams to be able to do 120 hertz frame rate. Um, on the right, NH NEC showed a 4K HDR encoder uh, with just 99 milliseconds latency streaming at 77 megabits a second, and the picture quality was just gorgeous on this. This is a prototype unit, I don't know if you can see down here, but this is actually the board, and what they're trying to do is, is sell the board and chipset to anybody that would want to build it into an encoder. This is the dual monitor, so get your head around this concept. This is a very high intensity backlight. Um, it can do the 2020 space, or a good chunk of it, but to get the black levels required at an LCD, which is not easy, what they do is they have two panels. So one panel is actually your imaging panel. This has red, green, and blue filters, 
and the backlight to drive that. Then there's a second panel perfectly aligned with that that works like a monochromatic light shutter. So what this is doing is this is actually shuttering down when you have uh, content with very low luminance to give you a black and not a low gray, which is very characteristic of a lot of LCD monitors. And then similarly, it's wide open at the high end so that it gives you very intense white for specular highlights or intense peak color. So um, this is not an actual product. This is a prototype. It's something that they're playing around with, but they're hoping they can bring this to market at some point. Um, peak brightness is around 2,000 candles per meter squared, and I believe it will just go right down to black, so you could be in the range of OLED territory as far as very, very low black levels. So um, clever engineering, and not too many people noticed it. Um, now we're starting to see um, the guys that go between formats. So we had a few of those last year, and here we are again, BCOM talking about SDR to HDR format conversion in addition to the Technicolor format, which does exactly the same thing. There were a handful of other companies saying jump back and forth between SDR and HDR to achieve bandwidth efficiency and um, cut down transport rates. Uh, there's the AJA KI Pro 4K HDR recorder player in the middle there, and they had a nice demo of that. And over on the right, BBC was showing hybrid log gamma uh, compared to um, PQ, so which was very helpful because a lot of people don't understand how hybrid log gamma works and that it's not really necessarily metadata, it's just a gamma curve, but it was helpful that they had the explanation. LEDs. Um, LEDs are absolutely taking over the world. If you remember back in The Graduate, the advice that Dustin Hoffman was given at that party, he says, I've got one word for you, plastics. Well, I would change that to LEDs because they aren't everything. And they're backlights, so we have white LEDs with color filters. We have more exotic backlights that can actually be red, green, and blue LEDs. We have small direct view monitors, white OLEDs with RGB filters and RGB OLED emitters. OLEDs are very much LEDs. They just use an organic film layer as opposed to inorganic junctions. And they are increasingly being found in large direct view displays in red, green, blue arrays, various pixel stripes with fine pixel pitches of 1.5, 1.2, and even point. 0.9 millimeter and 0.8 millimeters in the works. To give you some perspective on how fine that is, if you were one of the guys that had the money and you anteed up to spend 25 grand or so or 30 grand about 20 years ago to buy a 50 inch plasma, your 50 inch plasma had a pixel pitch of over 1.2 millimeters and that was 1280 by 768 or 1366 by 768. So we've already gone past that. And these are using micro uh, surface mount LEDs. Um, the thought is that they can get even lower than 0.8 millimeter, which prompted some people to say, maybe we can build movie screens out of these. And in fact, I believe Samsung now is pitching that idea of actually building an entire movie screen out of LED arrays. And of course, they're in every power or function indicator you can think of. So yes, it's the invasion of the indicator snatchers or the display snatchers. LEDs are everywhere. So uh, here's Boland showing uh, white OLED uh, monitors uh, with RGB stripe. Uh, these are all coming out of the LG factory, LG display factory in Korea. And then RGB, smaller RGB OLED monitors in discrete RGB. And then Sony's uh, high dynamic range OLED monitors in different sizes. Again, these are discrete red, green, blue modulators. Um, Unilumen. Um, I have no idea who they are. This is the first time I've ever heard of them. Uh, they are a Chinese-based company, and they showed a 1.5 millimeter fine pitch LED wall. And of course, you're starting to see a lot of these show up on TV news sets, especially for things like weather, uh, traffic. Um, they're relatively economical nowadays, and um, they're a lot easier than doing rear projection, and they take up a lot less space in terms of thickness than a discrete LCD display. And of course, they're a lot brighter. Uh, in this pitch, just to give you some perspective, 0.9, 1.2, 0.5, we're probably talking about maybe 400, 500, 600 candles per meter squared. Uh, we can get brighter, but given that incredibly fine pitch, that's a tremendous amount of power that's going into the panel. And of course, these are all running in switched mode. Over on the right, Layered, who again is a company not many people know of, but Layered acquired Planar and Clarity a few years ago, um, large digital signage companies. So now some of us know who they are, and they had a 0.9 millimeter fine pitch LED wall. So currently this is about the finest pitch you will see, the smallest pitch. And um, you can actually build an 8K display relatively easily out of one of these um, uh, 0.9 millimeter blocks. So several blocks put together and achieve 8K resolution. Um, 
two more companies I never heard of. Uh, I have no doubt they'll be at Infocom next month, Absen and Create. These are all in the North Hall and showing many different things you can do with LEDs. So you can make them in pretty much any size you want, any shape you want, any aspect ratio you want. You can do it vertically, you can do it horizontally, you can make trapezoids out of them. And that's what's really so exciting about this technology, the fact that it could be made to any shape in any size, it's just all tiles. Uh, of course, the question with LEDs always remains power supplies. How reliable are the power supplies in them? And I think this is one of the reasons that a lot of these companies are having a little bit of trouble getting started in the market is that, number one, very few people know who they are, and number two, it's a question of uh, device reliability. But make no mistake, the technology is coming and it will get better. Um, 8K. Well, those of you who were fortunate to get there, this was an absolutely amazing demo in the NHK booth, a live concert by the Tokyo Symphony on an 85-inch LCD screen with their multi-channel spatial sound. Um, sitting in front of this TV for a while and watching this, um, I kind of lost track of the fact that I was at a trade show in Las Vegas and I actually thought I was sitting in the audience. And the audio cues and the intense uh, resolution and the very large screen all contributed to this kind of a out out of body experience, something Roger Ebert used to call watching movies. And then again, that begs the question, uh, would you rather put headsets and headphones on your head to have VR or is sitting in front of something like this with the correct spatial sound cues and very, very large screens and very high resolution video, does that work equally well for VR? Another demo that they showed, they showed this last year, was comparison of 60 hertz versus 120 hertz video shot with 8K. Uh, clearly, the 120 hertz, uh, no pun intended, is a lot sharper. Um, so there's exciting potential for that, for live sports, live events. Uh, the challenge, of course, is the TVs typically will not refresh at this rate, and they will not recognize the signal rate coming through the interface. So we have some issues to resolve there. On the right, they showed a wireless link and encoder demo, microwave links for production being able to stream 8K from cameras uh, to a uh, production suite of some kind to, re to do recording, switching, live broadcasts. Um, other interesting stuff at the show, um, everybody seems to be stepping out of their comfort zone, GoPro in the back, you can just barely see them, um, after several missteps and fits and starts is bringing out a drone, because it's very hard to make money selling action cameras. And DJI, who's probably the largest drone manufacturer there is, uh, and certainly they have the largest booths, has decided to get into the camera body brace uh, business. Um, this was a very interesting thing that you sort of put this little strap on with two pegs on your shoulders, dip your head, lower it in, and pull the camera up. So uh, very, very interesting and affordable uh, fluid body brace, like a steady cam. On the right, uh, it's a very interesting short throw, ultra short throw projection onto glass uh, using uh, Panasonic high brightness projectors and their very sophisticated mapping software. So different ways to do things. Um, also, Samsung, who did not show their HDR, did show Ultra HD digital signage. I've mentioned before in some of my uh, courses that uh, the supply chain is switching all to 4K as far as uh, LCD displays because the cost to manufacture large LCDs with 1080p or 4K resolution have basically leveled. So uh, companies are moving away from 1080p and now moving to 4K. So you'll see these in sizes from 55 inches all the way up to 98 inches, and, and even in some cases we're seeing prototypes of 8K 98-inch displays. On the right, Soliton, who was showing some VR last year, has this um, tiny little ultra-portable H.265 encoder. This is another Chinese company, you may not be familiar with them, called the Zhao S. And um, I don't know why I would strap one of these to my mountain bike while I'm ripping around, but I guess maybe I've got a 4K camera on the front of the bike and I want to encode on the fly and transmit to something. So um, keep an eye on uh, the Chinese manufacturers in general as they come into the market and the effect that they will have on hardware prices. And the LEDs, they pretty much dominate that market, so not much of an impact there. But if they start to, to get into encoders and cameras and other things, you will see prices come down. And... Um, no visit to NAB would be complete without visiting Mr. Paul Beck and his wonderful collection of old cameras. That's where my little picture at the beginning of the presentation came from. He had an RCA camera from 1961, which is the one his hand is on, which was running with turret lenses, and an RCA camera from 1964. And you can see that turret has been used many, many times. So um, it's in the central hall. It's well worth a visit just to remind us how far we've come. And of course, it's appropriate that I'm taking pictures of these monster cameras that are 525 line cameras with something not much bigger in my hand that's shooting 4K stills and uh, 4K video. 
And uh, perhaps the most significant thing was I went to see Steely Dan live at the Venetian in 8K with high dynamic range and wide color gamut plus spatial sound. Nothing beats a real performance. Uh, I was very fortunate that they were playing a, uh, a 10 gig uh, uh, stint at the Venetian and this was the second to last night and passed the word around and a lot of us fellow SEMTI folks and ATSC folks and everything managed to get tickets and show up. So um, it was fun. I am a big Steely Dan fan. So. Some random thoughts, we'll wrap things up. Um, hardware prices continue to fall, just as in the CE sector. So what you will see is that the emphasis will be more on software and managed services as profit centers for all companies. And I'm already starting to see some of the larger manufacturers moving in that direction. Software as a service and subscription services are increasingly important to the bottom line. So um, customers will say, well, I, need, I know I need to do this or that or install this or change to this particular operating system. And a large company who might have vended hardware to them in the past will say, well, how about if we do that for you? And we will take care of software upgrades, we will maintain the servers, maintain the equipment, and then for a monthly fee, there are additional things we'll throw in there. So it's what I like to call the monthly incremental revenue or annual incremental revenue. It's very much based on and similar to the mobile phone model where you pay a certain amount of money to your provider every month. Uh, for the privilege of you know, downloading cat videos and going on ESPN and sending text back and forth and everything. And yes, 1080i, 1080p HDR for broadcast is a thing. Um, John Humphrey at uh, Hitachi has been very vocal about this and now I see Sony is talking about it and um, other companies are starting to perk up their ears and saying this might be a more efficient way to get HDR to the home, at least out of the gate until 4K becomes more widely implemented. Um, will consumers embrace or even understand ATSC 3.0. I don't think they'll really understand it. I think they will understand what it brings to the table. There was a press release that just came out after the ATSC meeting saying that consumers do like a lot of the new bells and whistles that ATSC delivers to the home and for that reason some of them might even buy a new television. Is there really a need for VR in its present form or is it the next 3D? This is obviously a touchy subject. Some people get really upset when you bring up 3D. They, that's the, <laughs> the word which the name we dare not mention, but it's possible because at the present time it's a, to me a very crude implementation and I think there's better ways we can go with it. How soon before H.265 encoder prices match those of H.264? Well, again, uh, with Chinese companies and Asian companies getting into the market, that could be happening a lot quicker than you think. My last question is, will fine pitch inorganic LED displays eventually replace OLEDs? If we can build a display that has a super fine pitch, and it's in organic LEDs, and of course there's no limit on brightness within organic LEDs. They can really crank it up. At some point, do we need an OLED? Um, because we can now go far farther beyond uh, what an OLED can do in terms of brightness, dynamic ranging, and color saturation. Not saying it's going to happen. I'm just throwing it out there because you can clearly see where the trend is heading. And last but not least, I just have to ask this question: Why didn't Steely Dan play Deacon Blues? Man, I really missed that song. So. Thank you very much for all tuning in, and I hope that's a useful summary to you of some of the cooler things that I saw at NAB. As always, an excellent presentation, Pete. Uh, yeah, Deacon Blues, uh, they didn't play it. I wonder why. Well, they played it last year in the show, and uh, they didn't play it this time, so a few of us were a little bit disappointed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would uh, like to in now invite our uh, guests uh, to uh, post questions or pose questions to our speakers. Uh, they can either be standards related or they can uh, be uh, questions specific to uh, Pete's presentation. Um, Pete, I do have a, a fundamental question. You were talking about LED screens. Yes. Um, and uh, you said uh, that you had seen some uh, or that LED, some of the LED screens were operating in switch mode. What is what is switch mode and and related to that? Um, I bought a set that has uh, in plane switch switching uh, IPS. Uh, what okay. the heck? You're confusing two different things here. It's apples and oranges. In plane switching okay. pertains to the liquid crystal alignment layer. What happens to the liquid crystals when they rotate or tilt to pass or block light? Mm -hmm. So um, in plane switching, they rotate horizontally vertically aligned, they tilt. It's like they're standing up and then they just sort of fall over. Mm -hmm. When I say switch mode, what I mean is that LEDs are actually not on all the time. What they're doing is they're actually pulsing on and off at a very high frequency. Uh, and that can be several hundred hertz. The reason you do that is that during the off cycle, they're not drawing any power. 
So your eye can't see that switching because it's happening so quickly, but it just sees it as continuous, continuously on. But there's a tremendous uh, energy savings that's involved with that. And because uh, LEDs are instant on, instant off, you can have extremely fast switching speeds, you know, in the five, 600 hertz, which is great if you're going to be doing things like uh, fast motion, high frame rate. They're well suited to that. So that's what I mean when I say the term switch mode. I could also say pulse width modulation, but they're not really pulse width modulation. They're just uh, turning on and off. So okay. I hope that explains it. Yes, yes, that's very helpful. Um, we do have uh, one question here so far, and I do encourage our guests to ask questions uh, using the question box or the chat box, whichever is available to you. And the, the question is, uh, do you know if the uh, TV logic system could provide panels larger than 31 inches? Well, that's speculation. Yes, it could. Um, it depends on where that glass is coming from. Um, when I say glass, I mean the LCD panels. A 31 half inch size is, I'm going to speculate here, in all likelihood coming out of the Panasonic factory in Himeji, Japan, um, because that's the same size as the panel that they they have, and they've uh, OEM that to other people. But yes, the technology is absolutely scalable. The question is at what price, because now you have two panels in there and you need a much more intense backlight built into it. So yes, you could make larger panels. I don't know if you could make a 55 inch uh, that would be affordable, but you could probably make a, a 32, maybe even a 42. Um, but it's a very clever concept. I, I can't say more about it than that because I just don't know where they're going with it. But I can tell you that it works really, really well. It does what it's supposed to do. Um, and it makes that LCD monitor uh, look more like, say, a really good OLED, a high dynamic range OLED like a Sony. Mm -hmm but with a much higher peak brightness value. Okay. Um, and I may have missed it, but um, did you mention quantum dots at all? I didn't. And the reason I didn't mention quantum dots is nobody was showing them there. Um, quantum dots, for those that don't know, is, a, is another way to get to high dynamic range. And what that involves is a tiny little nanoparticle called a quantum dot. This is a, a made of a metal compound. The most common ones would be cadmium selenide, and the second most common would be indium phosphide. What happens is you make these quantum dots to a specific size. You know, to us, you probably wouldn't even see them. They look like little pieces of dust, but you make them to a specific size. Mm -hmm. And then when you hammer them with photonic energy, you know, like you basically bombard them with photons, they then give off a color. They, they respond. They convert that energy into another form of energy, which is the quantum effect. And uh, typically, they will give you a very intense green and a very intense red. You can also make uh, blue quantum dots, but the way the structure is in TVs that use quantum dot technology is they use blue light-emitting diodes, uh, much like they'd have an array of white light-emitting diodes in a standard TV. And then in the LCD stack with polarizers and the actual LCD panel and everything, there is a film that's very thin that looks kind of yellowish, but that has the red and green quantum dots in it. So energy that hits the red and green quantum dots produces red and green light, and the blue light passes through the panel. And that's how you do RGB imaging. So with quantum dot technology, you can build a monitor that will give you uh, 2,000 candles per meter squared uh, specular peak highlights. And uh, I was surprised that nobody was really showing a display that had a quantum dot technology built into it. They're very stable, uh, unlike the blue that is found in, say, OLEDs and phosphors and things, which tends to degrade over time. The, um, the blue LEDs are relatively stable, and we don't need a lot of light from a blue LED. We're very sensitive to it. They're not running at a tremendous amount of energy. And the red and green uh, quantum dots are very stable. So you can make a reference monitor out of quantum dot technology that gives you high dynamic range, but also give you the wider color gamut, and would also give you high frame rate, because again, it's LEDs that are switching on and off. So um, I was looking for those. I didn't see one at the show. I was a little bit disappointed, but I'm going to pretty sure we're going to see them next year. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, next question. Um, is there anyone that has uh, quantum dots per pixel? Uh, isn't now a light field? And let me put my glasses back on so I can read the question intelligently. <laughs> let's see. Is there anyone that has quantum dots per pixel? Isn't now a, a light field not a per pixel matrix? It's not, but the question that they're leading to is can we build a, a purely emissive quantum dot array, which would be electroemissive versus photoemissive? Um, yes, it has been done. 
and it was very expensive to do it, but it worked. Um, the, the problem is, and you have to keep all of this in mind every time we have these conversations about why can't they do this with a display? Look at the prices where displays are selling for, especially in the consumer market. Um, we may have $30,000 professional monitors, but there's not an awful lot of those sold every year. But there are an awful lot of televisions that are being shipped and sold around the world, figure 20 to 22 million a year. But the prices are very low on it. So to implement that technology would be kind of expensive. However, there are at least three companies that are working on going from photo emissive energy, stimulating quantum dots, to a quantum dot mounted right on an LED chip. This is something Hisense in China is working on. And then ultimately to a pure electroemissive quantum dot, which if that works, and if the price is right, it'll pretty much kill everything else on the market in terms of a direct view monitor because it, it gives you everything you want and it has basically no drawbacks. But right now, uh, pretty expensive to man manufacture. Um, but I no doubt we'll probably see one by the end of this decade. You know, somebody will have one and maybe even sooner we will have as a prototype a electrically emissive quantum dot display per pixel. Very good. Thank you. Um, there are no uh, further questions in the chat or um, anywhere else. I take that back. It seems that we have one that has popped up in um, a different place than normal. And it says, uh, it seems like the technology in consumer monitors are outpacing the pro monitors, for example, size and HDR capabilities. Do you see a trend here? Are we going to have to use uh, consumer monitors in post? Well, it is outpacing it because that's where the money is right now, although some people would tell you there is very little money to be made in consumer televisions. That's why so many people are migrating to 4K displays and HDR and wide color gamut because they can charge more for those. Um, yes, it is absolutely outpacing it. I mean, I will go on record as saying I don't think that a professional monitor in the 30-inch size should cost $30,000 when you can buy a really, really good consumer monitor. It's not a reference-grade monitor, but you can buy a really good consumer monitor for less than $2,000. So yes, it is outpacing it. When will we see it in the professional channel? Well, as I just said earlier, I had fully expected to see at least one prototype quantum dot LCD monitor at NEB, and I did not see any of them. Um, it would seem to me that a market for a monitor like that that would cost maybe between five and $10,000 would be a very strong market, and that could certainly be done. Of course, a lot of things would have to be built into the monitor. So you'd have to have selectable LUTs in the monitor, absolute control over everything. Um, and of course, the various inputs that we require to make such a monitor work. But if you're very observant in AB and you look around, you'll see a lot of the companies selling monitors were showing a 55 inch, not a reference monitor, the different names for it, a green room monitor, client monitor, and everything. That's the LG 55 inch white OLED panel with an RGBW stripe. Everybody's buying that panel, putting their own electronics in it and selling it as a general purpose monitor. So yes, that that's already infiltrated the professional market. but uh, we're still waiting to see the smaller reference grade a monitor using something like quantum dot technology. We do have reference grade OLED monitors, and those are using red, green, and blue OLEDs. That's not a technology that's available to consumers right now. Um, but we have yet to see the the um, quantum dot monitor, and I'm surprised, that, again, that I didn't see it. But I'm pretty sure next year we will see it. Somebody will bring it to market because mm -hmm. I think there's a hole to be filled there very much. Uh, another question. Um, will there be uh, an issue between uh, grading on LCDs versus OLEDs, especially in the black uh, region? Um, well, that's a tough question to answer because there's all kinds of tricks you can play with LCDs to lower the black level. And these tricks are already being played on you on your LCD TV and you may not even know it. Things like dynamic contrast, dynamic gamma, et cetera, et cetera. So as the uh, overall scene level drops, the scene light level, uh, the picture level's dropping because they're modulating the backlights. Um, I personally would rather grade on an emissive monitor and not a transmissive monitor um, because of the fact that they can come out of black in a very linear fashion. They can show many, many low levels of gray. Um, they don't, they're not limited by the transmissivity of the panel. The quantum dot monitor, I think, would achieve that. Um, I think that would be the one that would get us over the hump. The other one that would probably get us there would be this dual LCD design if it proves to be practical and if it proves to be affordable. Uh, because that's certainly with dual light shutters, that does get you down to the performance 
more resembling what you would see on an emissive display, a really good CRT, a, good, a really good plasma, or an OLED. So <clears throat> uh, my own preference, I would rather grade on, um, on an emissive display. I'd rather grade on an emissive display because the viewing angles are wider. It almost doesn't matter where anybody sits in the room. They're going to see pretty much the same uh, tonal values, same color intensity, and same range from black to white, which is tricky to do with an LCD. So it's kind of a tough question to answer. Um, there are some really good LCDs out there, but the um, emissive displays, uh, OLEDs, and hopefully at some point the quantum dot LCD combination will, will outpace them. It'll, it'll make the necessary improvements. Okay. Good. Um, next question is uh, from Ted. Uh, have you, did you see or, or are you aware of any advancements in uh, 4K production workflows, uh, switchers? Not a particular market that I was looking for, so I'd have to pass on that one, and I don't know if um, Howard noticed anything at the show or Alan noticed anything at the show. Um, but it wasn't a particular uh, uh, market, it wasn't a product uh, segment that I was focused on. Sure. Yeah, I'll chime in a little bit. This is Howard. You know, <clears throat> I think 4K in the production side is becoming pretty ubiquitous. There's a lot of tools now that are available for that. I think even from the very small switchers up to the large switchers, they're all getting to the possibility of handling that. Now, the interface is the big thing. Um, I know that there's 12G out there, but I haven't seen a lot of support for 12G in products. It's starting to happen. Uh, but it's not across the whole industry. So, you know, you can get some computer interface cards that support it, but you got to be careful as you go across the display devices. And I would think most of the inter-material may start working on that. But it's it's an interesting time to say, do I do a 12G or do, do I do an IP? Which direction do I want to go in? So, um, you know, I think one of those things that we're just going to have to stay tuned in. Well, the other problem, and Howard just mentioned this, um, is how do you transport that? I mean, I did see a few companies with... 12G interfaces on their products, and then my first question to them is, well, what coaxial cable would I use with that? And nobody had an answer for that. How do I move it? The safe play seems to be four 3G uh, ports to move things around, but that gets kind of cumbersome over time to have four separate cables to move from point A to point B. And again, good point that uh, maybe this is a point where we start to think about just moving us over uh, an IT network of IP headers instead of worrying about, well, what kind of cable can I use? Do I need four connections? Do I have one connections? It's one thing to come out with a display interface or a signal transport interface. It's another thing to actually make a connection to it or running over any kind of distance and meet um, some specific signal and noise target for digital. Yeah, the other thing I think is really interesting in the post-production community, I'm seeing a lot more people using HDMI 2.0 and extended versus SDI these days for the interface to the display. So, you know, because we're seeing a lot more consumer monitors coming back into the post arena, and it's really a tough time at the moment, you know, there's a lot of questions on what's the interface, of course, HDMI, and then how do you calibrate those things, all that kind of good stuff. So it's a... Uh, Interesting times as far as interfaces go. Which which one do you choose? And and Pete's right. I see more quad 3G stuff at the moment than I do 12G. So it's uh, interesting. Yeah, most of the 4K uh, monitors, the what those that are Ultra HD 3840 2160, and then a few that are actually you know full 4K. Those tend to be smaller computer type uh, monitors with a higher resolution. Um, the standard interface on it is four 3G HDSDI connections. And then secondarily, they will support um, HDMI because DVI is too slow. You can't use DVI. And now I'm starting to see some manufacturers supporting dual uh, DisplayPort uh, coming into these red, in these monitors. There's a 27-inch uh, uh, LG product that's 5120 by 2880 that I, I believe um, Apple is also selling that. And that uses dual DisplayPort interfaces to get into it. So we're not really at the single cable point yet. We can do it with HDMI 2.0. Uh, because that has a maximum bit rate of 18 gigabits a second, um, certainly a lot faster than 3G. But uh, that's that wonderful gray area that I always seem to be focused on, which is uh, we can do anything with the display we want, we can do anything with the camera, and we can move signals around, but but the interface is getting in between things. This is where the stumbling blocks uh, are always popping up. And the cable issue itself, you know, cabling to be able to carry a signal with that kind of clock rate is, is a challenge. Yeah, and uh, Belden claimed to have a solution for it. I'm sure they probably do have some special cable that may cost you quite a bit to, to go with the 12G stuff. The other interesting thing I'm seeing is the, the race between Thunderbolt and 10 gig Ethernet. Uh, that's another interesting thing for 4K. Certainly when you get to 4K, 
um, one gig just falls apart and even dual one gig won't won't support you so you got to get to the 10 gig region and now with Thunderbolt 2 and 3 you're starting to see bandwidth on those things that are creeping up as well too although they're more prevalent on the Mac side of the world than they are on the on the PC side and then you have of course if you got NAS and Rage you got to you know kind of create those in different file formats so it's uh, it's getting interesting in the production side well, yeah, and not that I have these numbers committed to memory or anything, but uh, 4K, uh, let's say Ultra HD, 2160p, uh, 3444 is um, 8.9 gigabits a second. So that will go through a 10 gig switch. This is where why people are starting to look at it. And, and you can buy a 10 gig switch now. I, I just happen to be looking on, on Amazon. You can actually buy a pretty good managed 10 gig switch now for less than $5,000. So it's not exactly a very expensive way, a barrier to, to entry to doing this over IP. Good. Um, we've we've reached the the uh, end of our time, but uh, we do have one one final question from a good friend Angelo from uh, Italy. Uh, not sure we're going to be able to answer the question, but I want to pose the question: um, Who should train the directors to the new production language using uh, the new features? Boy, that's a that's a good question. I'll chime in a little bit. I I think we see the folks like the ASC um, getting involved to do some training. I think uh, uh, certainly the Directors Guild should I think step up at least uh, that's a, on the U.S. side of things, um, you know, and start talking about a different language. There's two areas really that need to be talked about, especially for directors. And one is, you know, of these new tools, 4K HDR. Um, how do you compose frame? treat um, production design especially having gone through that before uh, which uh, radically needs to be looked at uh, as you move into the higher resolutions and higher dynamic range and then the other one is in VR. VR is a completely different mm -hmm. thing to True. really learn and shoot and a lot of you know I've heard stories about you know directors coming in and shooting VR like they shoot regular uh, uh, cameras or regular programs in in uh, you know flat 2d space you, you really can't do that you really got to learn these new techniques so hopefully you know SEMPTI can step up to a certain extent although we have more creative folks um, I would certainly turn to the HPA uh, with this question and I think really the DGA would be great to step up uh, as well too and in the international community I can't think of the equivalent but the you know, perhaps Angelo can comment on, on those areas. But I think that's where it really needs to be done. All right. And it might not be a bad idea for a webinar or two, at least to introduce the concept. Sure. And and perhaps partnerships uh, between organizations uh, uh, might be an opportunity. So uh, we are at the end of our allotted time. We've gone over just a little bit, but I think it was worthwhile. We had some very good conversation. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Alan, Howard, and Pete for uh, always, always uh, wonderful presentations. I'd like to thank our guests uh, for taking time out of your busy day. And uh, we will close for today. Uh, if you are traveling anywhere, please take care, safe travels, and we'll see you on uh, another Simpty webcast at some point in the future. Thanks, everybody. Take care.